title of it. Today, on May 68th, Unfinished Revolution or 50 Years of Quantum. I think it could be the, it's not, it's not an either or necessarily taking a vote. Yes, it's important. We'll, we'll find out. Uh, the panel is sponsored by the Institute for Radical Imagination. We normally have panels here and we run classes. I passed out a flyer earlier on uh, our upcoming classes for the fall, which are part of a broader effort under the umbrella of the Free University of New York together with uh, Marxist Education Project and Democracy at Work. So it's a collaborative new project for, for this year. Uh, we have three speakers today, two who are on the editorial collective of our journal situations, of which uh, we don't have any to show it, I don't like, but no. people can Google it and find it online. Situations Project of the Radical Imagination. We've been uh, publishing since 2005. Thirteen years of, uh, of journals. And we have a we have stationery here if you want to put your email down and phone numbers to let you know more about events coming up. So, yes, yes. Political affiliation. Political affiliation. <coughs> uh, Michael Pelius here to my right is teaches philosophy at LIU Brooklyn and is one of the, the key members of the collective. Chris Knight, who uh, teaches at various CUNY campuses. Robert Latham from New York University in Toronto, who teaches political science and is the author of numerous works, including most recently, The Politics of Evasion, which is not about Trump and taxes, is it, or something? What, what's the, no. what is the, the evasion referred to? Capitalism. Capitalism. <laughs> yeah. So it is about that. It is a yeah. proper yeah. term. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to begin with a kind of general overview. I mean, one of the ideas uh, for this um, looking backward and looking forward, as in the Benjamin's Angel of History, is that um, uh, we did a course, and I, I actually presented most of it, called the Speculative Caesura for philosophical tendencies since May of 68. I did this about a, a year ago to kind of anticipate this 50th anniversary of May of 68. Uh, personally, at that time, I'll give away my age. I was about 17 years old. I wanted to hop a plane to Paris because I heard what was going on. I was in New Orleans during that, that, that time and uh, unfortunately didn't go, but followed the events very, very closely. And you know, at that time, personally, Tremendous interest in the in the films of Jean Luc Godard, and and uh, I can certainly say that La Chinoise, if you haven't seen it, the Chinese is, you know, a film that really actually anticipates almost to the letter some of the events that uh, took place that year, even though it was made in 1967. And uh, another thing I had heard a lot about uh, at that time I was uh, just beginning the university, Tulane University, was. Um, uh, the movement of March 22nd at Bonson was uh, kind of sponsored by Jean-Francois Lyotard, was one of the, the uh, internal, and I'm going to go back to him, I mentioned his name for a reason, that Lyotard, uh, you know, was part of the, the authority, you know, teaching authority, who actually helped articulate the movement of March 22nd and led up to, you know, the events of May Day and through the entire month of May. So with that said, I mean, there's a lot of background to this. Um, I, um, I think it's important to remember that May of 68 did not occur in a vacuum. This was something that was sort of predicated by very rigorous theoretical writings that were taking place in the early 1960s. And you know, certainly part of the post World War II generation of French intellectuals, um, Sartre and freedom as a concept was certainly one of the major, major uh, forces. I think in May of '68, some people expressed the fact, expressed the feeling that May of '68 was about Sartre's notion of spontaneous freedom at the, at the base of our consciousness, or you know, that this was something that manifested itself in the student movements and in the worker movements. Etc. 
But alongside of that, of course, Cornelius Castellanos, who said we need to study and we need to think before we act. You know, in some of his writings, correct me if I'm wrong, 1964, he's really talking about, you know, we need in, to study. In 1964, the journal right. Social of Barbarism folded. Right. Right. And he wrote a piece following, uh, in 63 it folded, in 64 he wrote a piece about the, the end of socialism, or socialism and barbarism. Or barbarism. And he went through a litany of reasons as to why the political situation in France was so horrible. You know, everyone is petite bourgeois, no one wants change, and so on and so forth. The only thing left to do, he said, is educate. And certainly it's a testament, not necessarily to their educational uh, efforts, but to how quickly things can change that from that. Castoriadis was not a lightweight in terms of political analysis and, and observation. In 64, saying the situation is more or less hopeless, and within four years you have, of course, the great explosion. Yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to play a little bit of the Patagonia, uh, since maybe some people are not familiar. Uh, and the two really works. And then, of on course, May 16th, by Castoriadis, uh, The Breach, and Henri Lefebvre, uh, Explosion. Explosion. The Explosion, right? The Explosion, right, the explosion, right was a major work on the events of 68. And when Chris Knight presents, Henri Lefebvre was a philosophical. Um, mentor, if you will, to the situation as well, we'll, we'll speak about that maybe, you know, during the discussion. So anyway, with this said, you know, as most of you know, this was a major uh, explosion on the, uh, on the, from the left, and left anarchists, left communists, et cetera, et cetera, in, in, in May of 68, in which the government was shut down by students and workers for one month. De Gaulle at that time had to leave the country. And of course, this was a wind that you know shifted, I think, many, many things on US campuses, led up to the Chicago Convention of 1968, and tremendous manifestations. The next big event, if you will, if you want to look at this as events that took place of where there was you know tremendous concentration of energy about changing the world. Um, was the Italian autumn of 1969. So having grown up during that period, studied this for a very, very long time, um, um, I wanted to think about you know, what went wrong, you know, <laughs> and what went wrong in terms of the philosophical tendency, since France has always been sort of the leading light since you know, the Vichy moment in terms of speaking politically to the left, or especially the Sartre. Merleau-Ponty, Castellanos, Claude Lefort, and others post-World War II. So I came up with um, you know, four tendencies that sort of happened after May of 68 and kind of lead up to where we are now. And uh, I'm going to locate this. But first, I'm going to talk about one of the tendencies that I don't consider that major, but it did create conditions for the new right to emerge in France, which were the nouveau philosophes. Uh, the, the new philosophers, uh, who included Bernard Henri Lévy, who is, you know, uh, Bierchard in, in France, um, who, you know, is a very powerful uh, intellectual in the sense that he's also an editor and maybe the chief voice of the editions of Grasset, a publishing outfit. You know, the left had Maspero, but Grasset is much greater range of okay. So Bernard Henri Lévy wrote a very reactionary book called Barbarism with a Human Face. And this set off, in my, my view, a tremendous right reaction in the 70s. And most of you know probably that the left, as a union of the left, only got 2% of the vote in 1978, after 68. Um, so Lévy, André Glucksmann, Christian Zambert, etc. And the interesting thing about the Nouveau Philosophes is that Michel Foucault's work, you know, who I will go back to as a major philosophical tendency, was used you know, by this group of new right in France to kind of justify, to look at you know, communism, to really build an anti-communism uh, moment, insofar that Schulzenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago was studied as this is what happens you know, in a kind of new time, time of totalitarianism. 
And another person that was very crucial to this was uh, Raymond Aron, right? Who was a childhood friend and colleague of sorts, and they wrote tremendously, you know, who was the thinker, you know, a la Hannah Arendt of totalitarianism at uh, this time. So anyway, to put that into the context, this is where someone like Kristen Ross, if you know the book, Fast Cars, Clean Bodies, kind of comes out of, France makes this turn to lifestyle, to, you know, we want to be, we want the rewards of the bourgeoisie. You know, to go back to Godard, the film Weekend may be indicative of this, where the, two, the bourgeois couple is always in search of more money, better consumer goods, et cetera. You know, juxtaposed, of course, with Godard, as he's so good at, uh, you know, with one famous scene of uh, the, uh, the garbage uh, collectors, right? <laughs> Talking about the origin of the family, private property, and the state, and kind of hold this bourgeoisie captive. So anyway, to, to, so to frame this, this, this is going on very actively. What, I, what interested me is how the left itself, you know, or people that were very either sympathetic or totally on the left, reacted to this moment. So the first tendency I, I call the period of slackening, the slackening period. Um, and this is best exemplified by, or which leads in a way, we call it slacker politics here, but I think this is not what Lyotard had in mind. So this is Jean-Francois uh, Lyotard's, you know, work that started the chain. And um, certainly American, you know, uh, politics. This, for people that don't know, was a a, a treatise that was commissioned by Quebec, by the government of Quebec, to talk about the status of knowledge in the period of computerization, the change to this technological epoch that dominates our everyday life. So this is one of the tendencies I saw. And what this led to, for many people, is a kind of relativism no longer a politics of engagement, a la sorte, politics of action, praxis, as in Castellanadas, a politics of thinking, vis-a-vis -vis someone else who, um, you know, another Greek thinker alongside of Castellanadas, very interesting, Agzelos, that we need a politics of thought, um, you know, alongside the action, et cetera. So this, this was a, a real turn, if you will, well, in terms of new analyses of what we can call, we call today cognitive capitalism, um, or at that time was called the knowledge economy, or the knowledge factory, to use a phrase of one of the Aronowitz's books. So from the Leotard position, you know, as most of you know, we, we've grown up with this, we've kind of come of age, Postmodernism became a household word. It became domesticated, right, et cetera. It led to many people say, what's the point of political action? What's the point of thinking through Marx at this point? You know, we have to learn in some ways how to adjust to capital. We don't have to love it, but in some ways this became to me a period of real slackening where people began to, you know, or especially on the left, began to adapt, you know? It set off, in my opinion, a wave of a new kind of careerism in the academic factory. Um, it set off a, another chain of writings that you know, were no longer based on the politics of praxis or engagement. So this was one, one major tendency. Mm. The second tendency, going through these names, would be what I would call the marginal resistance, right? That, that This became the politics of textuality, and of course, Daddy Dot and Agamben were the two major figures here. Right? That this became a I mean, this this marginal resistance. You had a resistance because the text itself became transformative. Yeah. Reading was a transformative activity. Right? which I, I believe in, but it's not the only transformative activity, right? <laughs> but everything became located in, in the text, the famous, the famous slogan, of course, of, of textuality, there's nothing outside the text. 
So this was a second tendency that obviously was tremendously taken up by academic power and in the institutions. I mean, Derrida, basically, this was a, a major war machine in the academy from 19, I'd say really from the late 70s, you know, all the way through the 90s, all the, you know, maybe up to 9-11, if you wanna kind of do, do some kind of dates here in this way. So, so anyway, the, the transformative activity is in the text. Was, was part of this marginal uh, resistance. So we became, in some ways, and Agamben is actually part and parcel of this in a very, very real way, we kind of became scholastics again. Right. You know, this was, a, this was very interesting. It became a kind of, even a Marxist scholasticism, or maybe even a medievalism, <laughs> especially in, in, in uh, Agamben's uh, case. You know, uh, who's a very smart person, and, and I think reads, uh, the Frankfurt School and a very interesting amalgamation of the Frankfurt School and of course of, um, of, uh, of Derrida and, and Heidegger even beforehand. So the marginal resistance was another, the second tendency that I saw and this, this had enormous force, I mean as we know, right, in a way. And in, in, in many ways it, it helped to depoliticize, you know. The revolution will be in the library only. Right? This, this was kind of the slogan that I take as an effect from this. So the third one, you know, we can, we can certainly discuss this later in more depth. The subjectivization of space. How space itself, and, th and this group, I, 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 they're different, but I think they, they fit in terms of a categorization, Foucault and Deleuze, right? That all of a sudden, everybody began to talk about being subjected, right? to space, the discourse of you know, subjection from discipline and punish to the medical gaze, all the way up to how we basically relate to the politics of space. No longer really that transformative, everything became very micro-oriented, a new kind of micro-politics, if you will. The macro is sort of taken away. And this fit very well, and as most of you probably know, Fukuyama in 19, right before Desert Storm, wrote the, the, the essay called The End of History, which was kind of the, 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 a major sea change, right? That capitalist triumphalism was here. There's no longer a history, right, that we have from the left. So the subjective space through Foucault and Deleuze. And Deleuze, of course, and we read this very actively, and I recommend it, Societies of Control. How control basically is what is being done here. Deleuze, of course, going beyond Foucault's disciplinary societies, that the disciplining of space is not enough. It's the control of space. And you know, just to give you a, a remark from one famous uh, fascist, uh, Goebbels, those who control the street control the state. Right? Those who control the street control the strike. My friend from the Greek pirates will say to those who control the sea, control the state. <laughs> but, <laughs> the nomadic, the nomadic uh, anyway. So the societies of control <laughs> is really very important here from the disciplinary side, which led to the subjectivization of space. Okay, fourth and finally, you know, I think there was a reorientation of praxis. And in my, my view, this is best exemplified by Alain Badiou, right, and by someone who's not read in America that actively, Bernard Stiegler. Um, that they think through a new kind of possible action. Now Badiou has created what he calls POL, the political organization to work with immigrants because he thinks that this is the, the group that needs the more, most agency. And so Badiou, even though being an incredibly abstract theorist, incredibly so, I mean, you know, I, I've read him for years and I still can't figure out the, the mathematical ontology, you know. But anyway, yeah. And, but, you know, in his works, ethics, metapolitics, the century in many ways, Badiou is still talking about the possibility of revolution, the possibility of a new rupture, right? And you don't get this kind of language in the Foucaults, the Derrida, it's more of an accommodationist moment. 
Yeah, if you can say something, if you want, it's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, just situate the general I'm just, just Where do you see the relationship between Bondu and Stiegler? Because I see Stiegler as a very kind of post-Heideggerian. Yes. Um, well, I was going to talk about yeah. kind of yeah. vitalist that's interested in uh, mimesis and uh, the history of technics, where Bondu is very much looking for um, uh, singularities within the space of being that yeah, give way to the possibility of yeah. I mean, as is Deleuze looking for singularities too. But, but it's yeah, a very different, very different kind of model. conception yeah. of them, yeah. right? Yes, um, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I see Steve Lair as part of a praxis school, you know, at this point, based on the categories I'm using here, that Steve Lair is talking about a transformative politics that has to do with techniques. Mm -hmm. It's very practical that way. He's someone who has founded an institute. Mm -hmm. He is someone who is doing ongoing, both empirical and political work through that through that so, institute. So you mean and very much on the practical level? Yes, on the practical level of, of the practice, whereas Vagu is more involved in you know, thinking through, as, as uh, some of you know, the events, right? Yeah. And what will happen with this May of 68, that it is an unfinished event, mm -hmm. hence the title of this 50 Years of Boredom. Cool. And I'm sure we'll get through this with a situation that's opaque. Yeah, opaque. That's an yeah. opaque. Yeah. We're, it's not an opaque. Sure. Yeah. Right. We're not sure yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, playing upon, I guess, the famous quote that Zizek misused of, uh, of uh, who was it? Chu um, La. Um, you know, what did you think of the French Revolution? It's too early to tell, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, they, these kind of plays are going on here. I find that, you know, thinking through both of these two major thinkers in France today, that it's very important to keep this on the level of where is their transformative praxis, and that they have more of a connection to the, now, but Stiegler has actually formed an alternative school with his wife. He's doing stuff that we're trying to do here in New York, like create an institute for the radical imagination to do a, a different kind of educational because he's, you know. And, and the interesting thing about, again, France in this context is that the state will support these alternatives, which is always a kind of paradox. And also our Canadian friend, who's not Canadian, but anyway, teaches in Canada, can talk about, you know, how the state is very good at you know sometimes saying okay we'll incorporate this alternative by giving money towards certain projects etc right so in, in many ways which to me again pre May of sixty eight Sartre was you know just a stipend area of the Gallimard House you know we had the the check and was never part of the institutional and the state apparatus which is interesting whereas a lot of these people were very dependent upon that. Particularly Leotard is commissioned by the Quebec government, continued to teach. Derrida, who, you know, the capital came from the institutions and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sales of books. Agamben, you know, as well. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I mean, Badu is retired now, even though, you know, yeah, he, I mean, you know the story. Stiegler has his institute, but there's funding at the Pompidou Center for this. Anyway, Again, I'm trying to map this out, yeah. and in, in a sense, it's, it's really, uh, what I'm doing today is it's just a kind of generalities one and a mapping I, of I, where I see these tendencies that have led us to this position of where now you have a Macron in France. We have a Trump, right? But Macron is a new model of politician who reads, right? <laughs> is much more articulate, the European scene, but is great at destroying labor. He is great in this. I mean, he really is. He's, they're, they're very smart at the, the way they're, they're doing this, in a sense. And, you know, how do we build up to this? And there are these tendencies feeding this. And what happened, you know, to the people such as Henri Lefebvre's thinking or the situationists or the more militant people? And if, if say, I mean, this is imagination, obviously. If Sartre had been alive today, or would he be possible in this kind of context, would there be any kind of accommodationist tendencies that are that are going on here? So that that's one of the reasons for my, uh, obviously for my interest here. So I think it's a very, I mean, to go back to what uh, Peter just mentioned about Elaine Badiou saying that it's it's it was opaque and too early to tell. I mean, you know, this is a long césure, a long pause that we're really living through 
where, you know, to me, the new, new analysis has to begin on, say, Lefebvre's later work, rhythm analysis, where is the rhythm of the movement now? What are the tendencies in that rhythm that we can work on? How do you change, you know, it's not only the contradictions themselves, but the tonal contradictions. So these, to me, to me seem to be some of the elements that we have to start, to, you know, engaging. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. I've been going, you know, 25 minutes. So uh, yeah, and we can we can come back and yeah. Okay. Chris. Yep. Um, don't want to have discussion. I'll go next then. Uh, I'm going to take you back to '68, uh, to the beginnings of the uprising, insurrection, whatever you want to call it. Um, let me begin with an overview of the situation as international, which was started by people like Guy Debord, Ra uh, Raoul Benigam, Benigam, um, Asker John, some of the names that are more obscure, mainly Guy Debord. Um, it began in, it went from 1957 to 1972. Some of the influences were Lautre Mans, Dada, and Surrealism. I, I think the strongest influence was Dadaism, which uh, came out of World War I, thoroughly disillusioned, and uh, set out to destroy art, because art represented noble endeavors and sentiments that sent them into World War I in the first place. Um, it was the grand illusion, to quote a movie from uh, Renoir. Um, anyway, this, this anti-art um, rebellious movement fed into the uh, situationists. Um, De Boer was also influenced by America and the Watts uprising, which she took as a promising sign of an insurrection spontaneously growing in, on American soil. He was very um, influenced by up, the uprisings throughout um, America, I think in the 1964-65, surely after Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, the involvement in um, May 68 began with the Situationists getting together with a group of students called the Enrage which is entitled, they took from the uh, French Revolution, a group of people enraged over this, the situation, it's capitalism now. Um, in Nanterre, they connected with these enragés and they plotted to have a revolution of culture, of politics, of a united, attack at the capitalist model with, that was ruling France, the bourgeois, the French. Um, this, by the way, the students were um, engaged and enraged over a document called The Poverty of Student Life, which succeeded in arousing a lot of student body and getting them to be politically active and to take to the streets, to barricade up the streets, to um, throw Molotov cocktails at police cars, and all of the uh, riotous behavior that you no doubt have seen pictures of or think of when you think of 1968. One of the most important documents of the situation is, and significant in the uh, insurrection uprising of 1968 was Guy Debord's book, The Society of the Spectacle. The notion of the spectacle was very important to Guy Debord, and I think he gave us, he provided us with a very important 
tool in which to analyze our society uh, and capitalism in general. Authentic life, DeVore wrote, authentic social life has been replaced by representation. All that was once directly lived has become mere representation. Being lived reality has been replaced by having, as Marx noted in The Commodity, and having now is supplanted by appearing the spectacle. This represents a complete colonization of lived experience by the commodity. Relations between commodities supplant relations between people. Passive identification supplants genuine activity. The spectacle is not a collection of images, but rather it is a social relation among people mediated by images. Now that was written by Guy Debord in 1967. Uh, what more present remark can you think of that predicted social media? Let that sit for a while. This leads to the degradation of knowledge and critical thought. The spectacle obfuscates the past and prevents the realization of the possibility of revolution, or Tina, there is no alternative. This comes out of the spectacle where we're blinded to the alternatives. Debor wants to wake up the spectator by the construction of situations with a sense of self-consciousness of existence. One of these strategies, and <coughs> De Boer was more a strategist than a philosopher, so I don't think he belongs in your four mm -hmm. tendencies. Um, he was a strategist, and one of his strategies was called detournement, detouring, or derailing, actually, is a closer translation. Turning images and expressions of capitalist culture against themselves. And <coughs> if you're familiar with ad busters or culture jamming, you know what I mean, where advertising is taken and a word or a, a comma or a image is added to the advertising to completely derail it or turn it around. Basically taking ownership of that image. One can move forward and look at the meme itself in internet culture as a kind of detournement, turning the original image against itself. Let me give you an example. Um, going back to Dada and Duchamp, one of my favorite artists, or non-artists. Duchamp, Duchamp's Mona Lisa was his Mona Lisa was a copy of the original Mona Lisa where he drew a mustache over it and I and well with a few letters I'm not sure L A S H O Q which is basically saying she's hot to trot or she has hot pants he took over the Mona Lisa and in a way mocked it degenerated it their attack on art um, the opposite we're seeing now of deternment, since the right always figures a way to retaliate against our most imaginative strategies, is recuperation, in which the spectacle appropriates radical ideas or expressions. And I can think of no clear, clearer example, familiar to all of us, as uh, the Che t-shirt worn by Jay-Z and other famous people or um, Kim Kardashian wearing a line of clothing that costs $5,000 a pop with a uh, hammer and sickle on it. Recuperation. We are alienated by the spectacle conversely 
Commodity fetishism inspires religious fervor. One could go back to Marx's mystification of the commodity. The spectacle is a ritual that supplants lived experience. And we are inside the spectacle. We are not just looking at it. And when, I, when you mention Foucault, it occurs to me that Foucault's panopticon, or Bentham's panopticon, which features in Foucault's Discipline and Punish, had been supplanted by the spectacle. Especially in social media, we are the spectacle, we are the product. So that uh, belonging to a, a, the spectacle also leads to a worldwide state surveillance system, which we're part of and which joins the spectacle. Okay, let's see. Just to uh, add to what you said there, sure. okay, philosophically speaking, going back to subjectivization of space, the inside is the outside. There's no distinction anymore when you say, you know, We're in inside completely. You can't ex no, escape the no, spectacle. No, really. <clears throat> the other strategy, sure, yeah. the other strategy I want to mention is le derive, which is the, um, an example of retaking urban space or space in general, the retranslation of space. Now, barricading streets uh, and one of the uh, slogans on the walls was that the barricade closes the street but opens the way. That's an example of the Derry changing or, or appropriating geography. I think of the Derive also in a recuperated by Pokemon, where you wander around uh, urban envi environment looking for anime that are created by social media or the internet. Um, lessons from the situationists. Well, the main lesson I think they would give <coughs> us, they would tell us, and I think we learned from them, <coughs> is don't fight the last revolution with the strategies that were defeated. They had fights with the Trotskyites and the Leninists and the unions who were basically asking for a strike for better wages, better working conditions, whereas the situationists wanted to transform the whole world and, uh, and uh, get rid of capitalism. So the... Um, lesson we had is that our revolution has to be complete, large, imaginative. The legacy. The legacy, as I see it, is, uh, it exists today in the Invisible Committee and um, maybe oddly enough, WikiLeaks which takes information and appropriates it, the secret information of the state, and appropriates it and makes it public. It's um, oddly enough because the situationists viewed the secret, what is concealed, as the most powerful strategy, the most powerful weapon. Um, and now we have a deep state and a um, organization that seeks to arrest the, the writer of the inv Invisible com Committee, um, who nobody knows, but they arrested Julian Coupat and put him in jail for six months as the author of The Coming Insurrection, which was written by the Invisible Committee. He still denies he's the author. And we know about Julian Assange, who's under house arrest in the Ecuadorian embassy and probably will be released to the deep state soon enough. The spectacle today, well, the explosion of images, social media, we have a president who embodies the spectacle. 
He communicates us with us through Twitter. Um, and I would like to um, end with some of the some of the slogans that were written on the walls of Paris during the 68, during the months of the 68 uprising. I put some of them on the board so that you could look at them and imagine that this is Paris 1968 and you're walking along and this is what you see. Boredom is counter-revolutionary. Run, comrade, the old world is behind you. Labor unions are whorehouses. You will end up dying of comfort. <laughs> that was a threat. Be realistic, demand the impossible. And power to the, I editorialized a bit, the radical imagination. <laughs> all power to the radical imagination. The, the original slogan was just all power of imagination. So that's it. So, okay. Um, yeah, I think my um, comments will connect to a lot of themes to some degree. I mean, um, I mean, uh, I mean of course, in the, the question that's posed in the panel's title, right? I mean, it's kind of whether we think of a theme versus there never was, that this never was really a revolution in the first place. I think that my comments will focus on kind of like the idea that um, you know, the fact that we can actually ask this question, right, and take it seriously means that, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's then not necessarily absurd. It says there's some interesting things that are going on. The fact that we can actually ask the question and then, oh my God, this is an absurd title, right? No one is, I don't think anybody is necessarily saying it. Uh, I mean, there may be criticisms, but uh, of the title, but the fact is, it's not seen as ridiculous uh, in a sense, right? So I, I think there's something in that, and, 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 you know, um, you know, and, and, the, and partly I'll speak to uh, something that was in mean, some of your panel yesterday, uh, uh, Peter, uh, on the you know the question of the fate of the proletariat and the central element, which in, already in the comments uh, was there, and certainly underneath a lot of, the, of, of what's already been said, uh, uh, you know, uh, Michael, Chris, and, and so, um, um, and we've never really come to terms with this very well, I think. Um, and I was at a I, I was at a conference recently uh, about a year or so ago, and uh, having coffee a few times with a it was a conference on capital in Athens, and a leading uh, leading scholar who's uh, who's moved himself away from his you know very uh, central position within Marxist theory kept saying to me, Robert, where are the proletariat? Where's the proletariat? Where's the proletariat? You know, he said it a few times, uh, you know, at different points uh, <laughs> when we would be. We Connecting, uh, you know, around coffee during breaks and stuff, and uh, and it's actually written on that top. I won't give the name because it's not it's not appropriate. He told me in person. You know, I wasn't saying it uh, in open. We're so not going to tell anybody. No, we won't tell you. <laughs> He's got the machine going. Now, so. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, so you know, um, and if I've been, you know, since doing that book on on the, the evasion, which relates to a lot of things we said, I, I've kind of been thinking about that a lot uh, as part of what I've been, uh, you know, uh, working on and. Um, so I'll look at kind of the context and conditions, so I think clearly we've already heard a lot about that, for that question, right? Uh, about this question of the, the, what is central to this in the working class, and it comes up all the time, there's other panels on this topic, quite a few, how to do this, how to do that, and so on. So, um, and it's first gonna give a position, just the way sort of Michael uh, gave a position on kind of some of his experiences, and kind of one of my first encounters with this long ago was through Beaujolais, Book, you know, right in the shadow of the silent majorities, right? Uh, written, it was in France, it was written in the late 70s. Uh, it came out in English, and uh, uh, we were just talking about some of your text, you know, I think in the early 80s and such. Um, and, you know, it's a, uh, also you can you encounter it in Marcuse, which also was a, one of the texts I was reading, besides reading lots of other things uh, on Trotsky, but looking, looking around uh, uh, at, at that time and all sorts of things. and. Um, you know, and Marcuse, of course, is a very one-dimensional man. That this kind of ongoing struggle within the whole Frankfurt School, uh, and uh, and of course, it goes back to the two to the twenties, right? It didn't start with Marcuse, but that suspicion 
that there's something wrong starts in the 1920s when in fact the possible prospect of a German revolution, even though the earlier decade, the failure of the earlier decades uh, process was still was looming, you know, and then clearly we, we know the mobilization that was still, you know, up until at least the, the late 20s and then clearly things were uh, starting to look pretty bad. And, you know, and people like Horkheimer were saying, hey, you know, what's going on? Uh, I, I, have some pro this, I have a problem, working class, uh, this, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, and then Eric Fromm wrote a great book, which I uh, did a study of the working class Weimar in Weimar, Weimar Republic, you know, in 1929, interviewing about 400 workers. And, uh, you know, uh, it was really, and it finds kind of all these bizarre ideas, you know, he, all across the political spectrum, many core communists and Spartacists and, you know, unionists and all the way across syndicalists and obviously even to the right, but he's really interested in really what's happening on the far left, those who are diehard, you know, kind of cadre, and he's seeing bizarre thoughts that he said, well, this is this dark thoughts going on here. This is before, I mean, the Nazis were already on the horizon, but certainly not necessarily as the power. So, um, so the question of, of Bochviar, in a sense, you know, the sort of stark statement, uh, you know, which I think is continuous of that tradition. He doesn't give it any recognition, but, he, but uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's not just silent and boring. They're not just silent and boring. They're, there's a, they become a black hole, right? That's kind of an essential point in the sense that anything that you throw at them, politically they, they undermine, they turn, they mock, it turns, you know, uh, right? All these mobilization efforts are gonna go nowhere. They just, shh, I won't go into the whole, the whole argument, but that's kind of, I think, the sort of central thing of it. What makes it more different, right? It makes it different. So, of course, the typical approach is to unsilence them, right? And you, like, there's so many books, you know, I just happened to do a Google search and, so I just did an article on silence and Marxism, but uh, uh, and, and I was looking at it, oh my God, you know, I can't believe how many books there are on how to, you know, do like Amy Goodman, right? They're here in New York, in Democracy Now, which has a book called the, the Silenced Majority, right? In other words, they are just simply the victims of, of the media, the capitalist media machine, and so on, the state, and so on. And the right strategy, teach them, provoke them, so on, right? That's the way, yeah. Of course, Bojo's answer is no. That, that everything you throw at them, you know, it's going to be absorbed in a sense. So, um, and he wasn't saying that it's a proletariat's fault. I mean, the work, the sun majorities, of course, the majority is the working class proletariat, the petty bourgeois, it's, a, it's also middle class and so on. But we know number wise that, right? I mean, if you go, right, the 50% uh, is something we would count as, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the fringes of the working class or proletariat in the sense of no, very little property and so on. I mean, uh, the student in New York was always pointing to the, uh, uh, you know, in fact, in Piketty's point, a uh, pretty long standing uh, statistic around the world is that 50% of most populations in countries don't have property or much property, right? We see this voice banting about all the time in, um, uh, in headlines and so on, kind of new statistics. Oh my God, people have $400 at best, you know, so on. So, uh, so clearly, the numbers. The numbers are very much leaning in that direction. We know. I mean, everybody's seen the Atlantic, the ten percent. We've seen the Lisa Garvey, the Atlantic is actually quite a good piece. That you know, from the one percent, though, it's actually the privileged ten percent. But it shows the incredibly unprivileged privilege. It shows how quickly everything just spikes down. So the silent majorities are not just your somebody in Missouri sitting in a nice big house. No, they're. They're, they're not so silent anyway. They were very actively, so they weren't really what he was talking about, right? It wouldn't, wouldn't have been interesting if that's what he meant. You know, keying off of Nixon's use of the word, he, it, but when, I think the problem with Bourgeois' formulation was with Nixon. Nixon was playing a political game when he talked about the silent majority really supporting the war against the uh, uh, unsilent youth and, the, and so on, right? That were, you know, so on. But in a sense, it was lumping together. It was a creation, and of course, so there's going to be no agency. There's going to be right this kind of lump together, no ontology. So of course, Bojar is going to find not much going on there, right? So what I actually use is a different term, um, a way of understanding it. I've been struggling with that. So the, uh, is the, what I call the contending masses. Uh, and, you know, yes, Marx uses the term. He talks about contending classes. I don't quite mean it. I, I use the masses exactly to avoid. The class claim is saying, in fact, it does uh, the majority of the contending classes it does include the working class. Uh, that the vast majority is that, and they mean those who are contending in the sense of struggling with capitalism and struggling against capitalism. 
right? And the, of course, the, the struggle against is one of the problems, right, which raises the pressure of the proletariat. And the question of contending, that means alliances, which is a longstanding notion, right? I mean, uh, we think of what, how, you know, again, think of all the work that Polanzas has done, how do we, how do we deal with the petty bourgeois, you know, and so on, with all that. Yes, and I think that, that we, we shouldn't ignore that stuff. Maybe Lenin struggled with some of these questions, what to, to do with the aristocracy and of labor and so on. So I, I think we have to uh, keep that in mind. So, um, and the thing is, to me, that already builds an agency. Um, so I think that, um, so basically, so Bourgeois, the sense is, you know, coming coming off of what the 68 and the failure of running into the 70s, and you should see some of his other essays. I mean, that, that, he's got a book that's actually been compiled on some of that, some of this thing in terms of dealing, you know, of course, the bitterness around the Mitterrand and, and so on, you know, which is part of the continuity um, that he's really going off the deep end. And, um, I, you know, I think the thing is, of course, it's a little, it's troubling for us, this question, right, this long period, call it border, we can do it for now, um, you know, the, the dialectics would suggest otherwise, right? I mean, no, I know we've had this ebb and flow uh, uh, across these periods since that, that 68, um, but we would think uh, that, that dialectics in both the different scales of dialectic, right, because, because of the large historical, it's, it takes place in the small, maybe up getting, you can, you can, you know, go read Bashkar and others, that, uh, Arthur, you know, Chris Arthur, very, you know, it's all laid out, right? Dialectics can take place at very different scales, both spatially and temporally, right? I mean, and it would suggest that, well, boom, something, the 60s should come back again, you know? So thinking of our Castorioros, I mean, you know, where's that essay? I'm waiting for that essay that then gets betrayed by history, <laughs> you know? Uh, let's hope for that. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know. We've seen a lot of them, and the, the four, we haven't had that four year later thing. So that, that raises another question, whether something's actually changed, right? I mean, we have, is there something in the context, again, uh, that has transformed, which Meiji Bolgiar was, and you look at other, his other work, and you, you can see pieces of it. And, and that's something where, you know, whether capitalism itself has transformed, um, and I can't go into it, I've been doing some work on it, um, recently uh, uh, around that, trying to think some of that stuff through. And uh, it's kind of the expansion of the uh, domains and, and ranges and registers of exploitation. Already, Marx already had pointed to different forms of exploitation that was, was beyond the simple the labor relationship itself. You know, in living, consuming, you know, company homes and so on. He, he, uh, what take place in the, uh, what was taking place in the countryside. He pointed to these, I think there was, and I think, this has been going on, uh, and whether this unsettledness of, of this more dynamic and dialectical, the dialectic within capitalism itself, the transformation uh, as a sort of totalizing capital that's been taking place, um, and this combination of far greater capacity to fabricate and invent. I've been recently looking at this whole question I call the untethered governance of capitalism. Uh, you know, it's kind of giving, cutting away from its moors that have anchored it. Again, if you go through, read Capital One, or read all the volumes, the incredible amount of which time Marx refers to convention, custom, right? You know, I mean, you think about, you know, gold is a great, you know, great example, very important uh, um, in that. But, you know, again, the, well, the famous untethering is, of course, the removal of the dollar from convertibility. In '71, and so every, everybody likes to key off. I mean, it was a very important kind of thing that took place. So this unsettled dimension of tethering, whether that, in a sense, uh, changes, it makes dialectic uh, uh, quite different. Um, and uh, you know, um, there's yet still, if we're seriously about dialectics, I am revolution resistance should always be possible, right? And we and we. Beyond, there's things that are taking place all over all the time, right? And, and that raises another sort of, um, which I'll come to, this question that you raised, this in-between period, right? That we're in the, this kind of period of, of, of an in-between, between rupture and stability. I'll come to that in a minute, but um, I want to talk about one thing that's ever, ever already possible, which raises another figure coming out of 68, uh, Danielle Ben Said, right? Very important, one of my favorite Marxist philosophers. Um, Actually, and um, you know, and one of the things, there are many things, but uh, one of the things I like, you know, he, de he develops the notion of the red mole, which is around the concept, which has been around, you know, in different places. 
King of Marx, Marx King of Shakespeare and Hegel, and so on. This combination of uh, you know, the mold that could appear, the, uh, the ruptural revolutionary moment that is, you can't really see it underneath, in a sense, uh, is burrowing through in, in history. Either our analysis doesn't have, get it right, or uh, or uh, it just you know it's dealing with conditions and factors that are that are. Uh, just not part of our, our knowledge at this point, but uh, you know, I, I mean, it's something you know. This combination of uncertainty and necessity very important to uh, Ben Said. You know, again, from a famous quote, it's it's all over Marx uh, that that combination. The most famous one, of course, is the introduction of the 18th. You know, it talks about the conditions of man, blah blah blah. Right? You know, we're all familiar with that. It's one very pointed uh, version of it, um, the one that we heard, but it, it's in many many places. Uh, Henri Lefebvre, of course, the aleatory, the chance possibility is already in there. Let's not forget the moment, you know, right? And then Althusser, all these thinking of the French, but uh, again, later, uh, uh, I don't think he gave Lefebvre much of a much recognition for the the moment of the aleatory uh, uh, Althusser, right? The late Althusser, the possibility of chance and combination, the explosion notion that would take place. Uh, uh, you know, now the question is, um, and the red mole is a, is a vivid image. It's only meant to be a metaphor, right? It, it wasn't meant to be a historically exact thing, but it meant to communicate. Marx used it that way, the mole, right? Uh, in that sense that it, you know, when you lose, the question is, is it about faith, about fidelity, a friend about you? I mean, is it the holding, you know, that, that or, you know, to me it's dialectic. I mean, no matter what, um, the ever ready possibility. Now, the problem with the dialectic is, that uh, it takes place uh, in two directions, right? I mean, capital, the dialect is part of shaping capital and it's using it all the time. The positive negating, right? Countering, those are all parts of, to me, by dialectical development. But, so that's the thing, right? So it's not like, you know, the left has an ownership, proletariat has an ownership of dialectic. You know, it's, it's absolutely not. I mean, if anything, you know, it's clearly capital has been the greatest possessor, so to speak, of this incredible dynamic um, that, uh, right? So, so it, it, you know, it can relate to that as well. Um, so, um, you know, so was Benzi, one of the things that Benzi kind of struggled with this question, okay, where do we, how do we get from, what, when is the mole, what, what, when can the mole pop up and show up? And also, what do we be doing? What should we be doing, right? That's, that's asking these two questions, you know? And, and one of the things he relied on indignation, and um, he thought that people, the workers, indignation emerges, and some of you may be looking at this teacher strike and seeing that, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but I'd argue, of course, it's really important that when I think about this notion of the contending classes, again, they're always, they're contending. They're struggling with capitalism. It's just that they're not necessarily conscious of it in the sense that we are, uh, is, is apprehension of struggle right, and oppression notion of how the apprehending it first, that that's really important, quite far from working class consciousness than anything that Luke Koch would, you know, who struggled to say, here's how it, right? It's not, we're not talking about anything near his ideal place. So, um, so I think in this, this term, I mentioned this in, in, in between period, in a sense, so I'll offer a couple like, thoughts on that. Um, it's contending, the notion of contending helps here, this, Problem is the mole can be digging for a long time, so to speak, right? I mean, and you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, I think falls between that and, and um, between the structural and the stability. So whether the stability is the really boring version, you know, the, the stuff that the, the bourgeois, that, that stuff, everything, those things on the uh, board and all the on rege and the things that the, the situationists and the dominoes were fighting against, right? This complacency and so on, that, that tendency, which supposedly became dominant after World War II, as things settled, uh, especially in the uh, North America, and then eventually in, in, in Europe, uh, as in, in, into the 50s and, and, and the UK, we start seeing normalization as the economic disruptions of the war uh, became, uh, you know, a little more settled. Um, but that's so. That's one hand of stability, and, and the other side is this ruptural moment, and this was this big grand in between, which I was mentioned before, and uh, we could say it starts in the early 70s or. And we find tendencies, I don't want to exaggerate that the 50s was some kind, you know, yes, 
And there's been work, historians have done some good work showing that the 50s weren't exactly what they were cut out to be in North America. Oh, of course, there's, there's, we're talking about tendencies here. Um, so we, you know, but the question is, do we really know how to operate this in between really well, right? I mean, um, and most of our theory is, a lot of our tactical theory and organizations for preparation for the rupture, to create, to facilitate, can't think of the, you know, to outrage, right? I mean, that was part, you know, right? Uh, that's part of the part of the notion there. Um, uh, and I, so, this, you know, how do we operate this in between? What does it mean to? That's something I'm, I'm struggling with now. Um, and I'm happy to see, you know, that there are a lot, there are lots, there are activists or some organizations that are thinking in those, those terms as well. Um, um, and um, so, the, you know, I think. I think we need different approaches to anti-capitalism. I, I can't go into it, uh, uh, but this joining up of things and connecting of things that we normally didn't. Um, and I, th I take a very collective approach to this sort of thing. I don't, I do not, my, my I, I just try to develop this concept of the arc of anti-capitalism. It, it's coming out in a, uh, a special issue of uh, Global Discourse in the next few weeks uh, on uh, augmenting the left. Uh, is the title of the uh, special issue. And um, there'll be a great range of pieces there, but the one I do is partly trying to look at this complex capitalism. What does that mean for our understanding of anti-capitalism, right? And so and I start from, a, again, hangovers of my Trotskyism, you know, kind of uneven, uneven, uh, combined, in the uneven, uneven combined development and permanent revolution moving past those points. Uh, to look at this arc of complex arc of anti-capitalism and trying to see how we might think of connecting even on some of the more extreme classic, not to throw out our class, what we now understood as classic approaches to parties, like even Lenin's parties, and people bristle at that sometimes, um, but also on the thing all the way to the far, people that are doing left Dadaism today and the Invisible Committee and trying to outrage us. So I'm trying to think through how that those connections happen, and different, and different types of engagement with the working class. Um, and I think um, that, you know, then the question is whether this, the kernel of that was perhaps in some of the thinking in, in, in 68, um, and somehow was that broken by the way some of the more traditional forces, uh, not just of the state, but let's say the Communist Party, it's only all that people make a lot of that. I, it's, it's, oh, I think it's exaggerated. Um, to which the Communist Party was the nail in the coffin of 68. I, I don't, I don't buy that. Uh, uh, you know whether it was a, a force or not. Uh, uh, you know to advance is another question. But um, so I think that we are, yeah. And that, that so that is where what things break through the surface and when, um, how close things are. Because again, thinking of the metaphor, the mold is sort of close to the surface. Where, what is the nature? How are we who are on the surface already, working with that, in a sense, how do we engage it? Does that, that, I think those are the things I'm, and I, in 68, which I think um, was part of it. I mean, it was not only, um, uh, and we know that, I don't know if I've done a study of a kind of student attitudes towards the workers. There's been lots of stuff around alliances, but not, uh, as far as I know, studies of actually thinking, interviews, perceptions, what was going on at that time. So the, the way that Fromm did that study of, uh, of it. And, uh, and Virgil Ullman, by the way, who's publishing with another uh, edited volume on Augmenting the Left, he's got a piece. He did an interview with not that many, about a dozen or so workers, but uh, it was quite interesting. It reminded me of the Fromm uh, uh, piece, uh, and there may be some connection around the alienation there. Uh, but uh, he, he did a study and found how, in fact, these normal bell, bell uh, they were whatever Verizon workers or something downtown around Broadway Lafayette actually were you know didn't take it didn't take it long for them to actually become radicalized in a sense you know to you know uh, was it leading them on okay but they didn't have to you know they could have got up or didn't say no or something you know it actually started to grab grab on hold of the discussion and so um, yeah so I think there's uh, uh, not there in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful in the sense that I, I'm seeing that among some groups and even some that are here at, at uh, La Forum who are thinking in these type of terms. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'll stop there.
questions, comments, interventions? Uh, I, have, I, have to, to me, I have an old friend who's old enough, uh, as old as I am, so we, we remember 1960. He made a comment the other day saying that the current situation reminds him of 1968. But he wasn't able to articulate why exactly it does and what the similarity. And I came to this session in the hope of learning the answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, personally, I, I don't think it's really comparable. I think the objective situation is very, very different at this point. We, we live in a, a very different form of capital now that we have to rethink. And one of the reasons I put up some of these names, at least for my my purposes, uh, is to kind of understand these transformations. Yes, please. The, the title Unfinished Revolution would imply is that there is something in continuity there. I think the metaphor of the red mole, and, and by the way, George Bataille wrote on the mole, and you know, the very, very be beautiful piece during, uh, uh, right before Vichy. Um, yeah, I think the mole is sort of the, the metaphor that we're really trying to, to work with here. Will the struggle reappear? You know, as Marx says in the manifesto, sometimes the, the struggle is clear, it's active, it's out in the public, sometimes it's hidden, but the struggle continues. And, I mean, it's a very hard question to answer because we don't know. We're not, we're not predictive social science, scientists here or, or whatever. We, I don't think we're in that, in that kind of moment. I think p p part of my, my, my feeling is we really don't understand the complexity of capital at this point and, and its ability to continually set up something that we're also working through in terms of the radical imagination project, if you will is how much it can reduce people to servitude. Maybe not willing servitude, right? But a kind of, you know, how, how people ultimately become so conditioned to where, where we are, to acceptance, adaptability, you know, um, et cetera. And the interesting thing about May of 68, going back to what Robert said, was about the, the working class and the Communist Party, right? And, and that relation versus the students. I mean, the interesting thing is there were no targeted assassinations of uh, students, but there were targeted assassinations and actual assassinations of workers, including the famous Renault factory where Pierre Ouvernier was killed because he was an activist in, in the labor market. So in some ways, this is a lesson, too, to maybe take from May of 68 and how state terrorism and the state surveillance views students. They can talk all they want, Daniel Korn Bendit you know, <laughs> et cetera, versus that of people that are actually in the productive, you know, uh, process. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a very good question. I mean, I think it's a, you know, multiple, <laughs> multiple layered uh, you know, question that deserves a book, but I'll, I'll shut up and let uh, yeah, <laughs> other people. Yeah. Um, Robert Lathan, you use the term the unfinished revolution. Yeah. Um, what is that a concept like, um, I've um, read about a different word, the disembeddedness of capital. Um, we read an article by Kapalas, and Peter Brapsis has also written about that. Is that the same concept? You know what, the, uh, the, uh, the um, disembedding in terms of the Polanyi and Karl Polanyi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. No, no, it's different. I mean, like, there are some connections. Uh, and I should have said, like, maybe it's not the, un it's the untethered governance of capital. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's the difference. It's very important right. because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, three things. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the breakaway from conventions, established conventions, which were very important to capital. Right, that for so many centuries, uh, 19th century to 20th century, uh, the, the, the deregulation aspects and, uh, and then um, the, uh, uh, the third one is the, uh, I don't know the third one, uh, just put this paper uh, two weeks ago, but uh, uh, the, that's something, with it, I think it forms a law, something in terms of law and all that, but, but no, the hyperfabrication is part of it too, in other words, Relationships can be established. That again, suddenly, why is the yen dollar ratio so important, right? To so many market, daily markets. There, are, I've actually asked some 
tra you know, traders I know, uh, you know, distant family members here. So, but, but you know, gosh, it's a big deal. And they're like, well, you know, but, uh, there's no real rationale for it, right? Uh, but, the, for example, a tethering, so, that's a, so there's so many of those things exist now, and they just become signals in the system. And, but, but, but however, quite different was, uh, like there was a, once a concept called bond vigilantes. We're talking about the changing nature of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, bond vigilantes, right? Like they were basically, uh, this concept emerged in the early 80s, late 70s, that basically inflationary conditions, uh, uh, too much credit, time to sell bonds, right? Doesn't exist anymore, Those, they don't exist. The guy who invented it, this guy Yardini, last name, you know, kind of a little bit, who the fuck is it? Where are these people? Like, what happened? Like, he was to be one of them. Where is everybody? Like, what's going on here, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, so, the, right, so we, we know the credit expansions, that by all his recognition, when he developed this, and watching, he studied it for 100, 150 years history of that relationship that, right, that's gone, that's completely gone. Otherwise, the, the, the systems that are operational now, of quantitative easing, would not be possible, right? I mean, the markets are, hold, they're holding, uh, yeah, the whole different thing is, is, something has changed there drastically, so there's a lot of conventions like that. I can go through lots of them, I don't want, I don't want to use the time, uh, but, uh, and that's what I'm talking about. There's something, please don't I put my hand completely on it, but, uh, and there's still governance going on. I'm not saying it's freewheeling, you know. And uh, the conventions were very important to capital. That when the liberal state, the concept of the liberal state was there, I mean, the liberal state is a, uh, uh, un, un, um, you know, uh, a more laissez, somewhat laissez-faire, the conventions took care of stuff, right? The, the, you know, very important. Capital had predictable things. So that, so that's, right? So ironically, we're in this different place, the interventionist, economically intervention in the state. Uh, and you know, it's kind of weird that uh, we have this combination of heavy state intervention in the economy uh, with um, a, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the, this artillery, this, these other things that capital's own conventions. Marx makes a big deal, certain, he talks about certain value prices that sometimes he brings in the convention element. As to, well, this, is what, this is what the wage is by convention and so on. And um, anyway. So that's what, I'm, so I'm just saying that's part of those conditions there. I think so you're, you're talking about state intervention, states becoming more interventionist on behalf of financial markets. Not right, yeah, which is neoliberalism, which is what yeah. neoliberalism, I mean, to me, that's, that's the definition of liberalism. You know, I put it like a student in the class said, there's a line, there's state, there's a state intervening to create for public, you know, for people, and then there's a state doing stuff for, uh, the ruling class for right for capital for corporations the wealthy and it's just simple that that was the way we go back and read the original thinking of the Olympic that was the move right it's like hey these guys use the developed state um, you know hey we can use it for our own ends but let's forget this idea of night watchman state you know get get you know no let's use this thing let's harness it and that was the revolution in their view right that was the major simple notion that and I, I see it that's what I see happening I mean and you know Trump is on steroid, maybe the neoliberal steroid dimension, and they're just doing yeah, doing just really going crazy with it, right? So uh, markets are only uh, one way that that's pursued. Uh, there, there are two uh, two early twentieth century uh, moments that I think speak to this. Uh, J. P. Morgan is you know involved in the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, right? Even though he's the yeah. banker that helps create the crisis conditions, right? And we see this replay many times, I mean, at least fundamentally replay with the Bernanke, you know, um, you know, um, from Paulson to Bernanke in the recent crisis, right? That they bring in the same cast of characters who created the situation to fix it. And then, of course, Joe Kennedy, appointed by you know, Franklin Roosevelt, a major speculator, right, who helped create part of the crash, right, becomes the first chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So, you know, I think this is maybe something. Wasn't he placing major thing. short bets, too? Yes, they, they were, he made major short bets. That's how, that's how they made the original fortune before the Scotch whiskey, the ambassador to uh, Scotland. A little hard to imagine students, at least in this country, being revolutionaries now because they're, they're plunged into so much debt. You know, that, and I think that that speaks to you know 
the iron control that financialization has taken over with it. I did want to ask Chris just a little bit more specifically because I don't know much about it. Uh, you mentioned this student group called the Enrages. Um, were they uh, in Paris or were they outside? Were they in Nanterre or where were they? They began in Nanterre. The, this group that was influenced by, and I can't remember the, the author's name of The Poverty of Student Life which basically described the entrenchment of the university of teaching outmoded, out useless ideas that only promoted capitalism and funneled the students back into um, nice government jobs and not questioning what the role of the university itself was, what the role of the student was. And they took the name from a group of revolutionaries during the French Revolution. Oh, okay. I, I find it interesting that they came from a, they came not from Paris, but from yeah. a provincial city within France. Suburban kind of suburban, quiet. Not, suburban. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And were they more connected with the labor movement too there in the Nanterre area, do you know? Not, no, the no, Parisian no. leg of the insurrection was much more, uh, connected with the Renault family factory and the uh, Sud Aviation, do you know that? Mm -hmm. That factory and um, it, but it is interesting that it began in, in Nanterre and not in the Sorbonne where it spread to the Sorbonne. And the Sorbonne was closed uh, during that period for the second time in its 700 year history. Uh, one, one reason Ontario was the origin was because of Henri Lefebvre. Yes, Henri Lefebvre was that. Oh, he was at that university. He was yes. there. Oh. And that semester he was teaching his right. book, yeah. which had just come out, Everyday Life in the Modern World. Oh. And the first student movement in March were students of his, or people who were influenced by his ideas, organizing for uh, the, the desegregation of the dormitories. Yeah. Because France right. being right. Uh, Catholic <laughs> had separate dormitories for the male and female right. students and they wanted to have sex. Right. And one of our, our Lefebvre's arguments was, you know, the everyday is the most important level. How good the coffee is and the bread is, it's not a minor thing, it's right. fundamental. Right. Right. And certainly right. sex is yeah. part of that equation as well. So uh, the, um, uh, this was one reason why Nanterre was the men invaded the women's dorms. The women invaded the men's dorms. The dark made a film called Masculine Feminine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and if you don't yeah. mind my asking a follow-up question, you mentioned that Guy de Boer was also somewhat admiring of the Watts riots and some of the other urban riots. Yes, in the States he was very time. impressed. Was he connected? obviously they were televised, and huh. he, you know, he saw a conversion of what. Uh, shopping, which is part of the um, spectacle, where we right. shop and pick out commodities, and it's alienating and isolating, and we don't become part of a collective. But for him, looting was the opposite of shopping, <laughs> and it was collective activity. And uh, right. in order to become... Good thing, good thing. <laughs> what? It's a good thing. In order to become an individual, you needed to be. In order to become an individual, you needed to be part of the collective. So uh, looting was a kind of individuation. It's hmm. interesting too. Yeah, I was thinking too. Uh, James Baldwin was he living in France by '68, or that may have been a. Bit well, he was earlier, then, but he he was probably because because I was wondering was yeah. De Boer was he also admiring of the urban riots from the standpoint of you know Malcolm X or the Panthers or did he kind of, or was it just the spectacle of the of going out and getting free stuff? I don't know if he read Malcolm X. I'm not, he must have. Yeah, yeah. He must I mean, have. He didn't write about him though. I mean, what's come up about the student, you know, the poverty piece that Chris is mentioning, you know, obviously in the States, Clark Kerr's idea of the university stimulated a great moment, you know, in, in a sense, the Fort Huron statement came out of that, an SDS movement, the, the anti-war movement, it was all spurred along by, you know, what is the role of the university, you know, in terms of what is it teaching us? 
you know, that kind of critique that was going on. So these things are very much interrelated. It's not like these just May of 68 happened in Paris. It became a, you know, a major, to use Lacanian language, a, a signifier of, a, you know, maybe a possible event of, you know, where things hit maybe a crescendo, you know, and uh, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. I, I just want to go back to one thing about the working class, since Robert brought that up, or, you know, I wasn't, unfortunately wasn't there yesterday for Peter and Arun's uh, 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 talk. And, and, um, uh, but, you know, going back to Bernard Stiegler, you know, the proletariat is being used by Stiegler as universal proletarianization. It's no longer that the proletariat really is one without property, <coughs> which the language means, but but what, what, what we've lost the capacity for, according to Stiegler, is the ability to make. And therefore, in that loss of the ability to make things and understand how things are made, we've lost the ability to live, right? And Stiegler, in a way, has, I think, put his finger on something very, very crucial. You know, it's not so much that it's only a, a simple class struggle or this notion of the proletariat, as Marx would invent, you know, the term in the, in the 19th century, it, it's that you know we've now become to go to the society of the spectacle, and when Chris was speaking about ad busters and how these things work, we're homo data, we're 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 data, we're no longer human in that sense, right? And this is kind of the frightening aspect of what's not going, as you say, about the students. The students are living in a world of where their data mind, and that's it. They have no existence. The, the, the lack of experience is amazing, too. You know, what is the level of the experience here? So, I mean, to go back to this again, I mean, I'm trying to weave many, many themes here, or many comments, you know, to back to, is May of 68 possible again? No, because it's a very different circumstance. And, and, and to what Chris, you know, actually pointed out, about, you know, when Du Bois says the tactics must be different because if you're only using the tactics of the previous revolution, you're bound to failure. Right. So f movements like the Invisible Committee or other movements around there where a group of youth that is thinking, they're thinking through that alienation is not a good enough category to describe what they're facing. It's not like some of the students that are, you know, <laughs> are totally, you know, out of touch, or the youth is out of touch. It's the question of that this old language no longer fits the situation. So, yeah. and, and, yeah, I would yeah, please. just like to yeah, add, sure. um, speaking of the university and learning, one of the things Stiegler gets from Derrida uh, is um, the proletarianization of knowledge. Everything becomes digitized, and as Michael just said, we become data mined, but we no longer rely on text anymore. We rely on, on data, on algorithms, on digital information. I have trouble remembering people's phone numbers. It's in my phone. It's my extension of my memory and my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> That's going out over the entire I know, oh, I'm sorry. The whole, it's going to be live streamed throughout the whole left forum. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep this in my head because I wanted to follow up on what Steve said about financialization and debt. It seems to me, um, along with what you just said there about homo datum and the changes wrought by the technologies, um, you also, don't you also have changes wrought by financialization in terms of the creation of a new subject? So uh, the, the new subject is a credit score rather than a worker, and the new subject looks to the financial markets to, as, as the savior rather, rather than vis-a-vis -vis an old relationship with the boss. Is this, um, is, is this have anything to do with changes um, that make this epic different from 68? Algorithms. We're Pardon changing me. every aspect of our lives, um, from social media to financial capital to... Uh, but the algorithms are means, or a means to the something else, right? Yes, right. Yeah, in fact, there was a very good book on the kind of talk about everyday life. He died in the 20s, 
Tony Martin who died in Wayne. Randy, Randy, Randy Martin. Randy Martin. Martin. Right. Financial Station yeah. of yeah. Everyday Life. Yeah. I think it was yeah. the late nineties or Yeah, he wrote it early two thousand. Early two thousand. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean he yeah. 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 captures that uh, uh, exactly what we're talking about, right? Yeah. How this is changing people's you know people's lives. It's not just about the large structure financial large structures, yeah. right. I mean exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's social so, relations. To give an illustration yeah. of your point, I taught this semester an essay by Francis Fox Pippin on Occupy Wall Street, going behind beyond mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street, where she <coughs> discusses the possibility of a debtor strike. That a debtor strike would be something where you could have enough leverage really to, you know, to I mean a general strike maybe is less likely, but a debtor strike could be a possibility. And I was shocked that more than half the students not only knew their credit score, but their first reaction was, well, what would that do to our credit score? Right, right. So exactly. this is really a, um, yeah, back to and I'm, I'm sure 1968 or 1988 for that matter, no one you know, who was in college cared about or knew about uh, credit scores or anything <laughs> uh, similar. So it's a, it is a, that, you know, that is a very different. But, yeah. but go, going back to this whole thing of the conditioning of the subject, right, or student, why isn't there a major movement against the $1.3 trillion worth of student debt in the United States? You know, why, why aren't students completely mobilized this when it's really in their best interest to do so, right, et cetera? And what's going to happen is the state's going to regulate to a point where they're going to be able to clip some interest, they'll they'll free up some loans. You know they're going to you know play with this in order that they don't lose you know big money on it and figure out ways to you know how are we going to recapitalize and, and re reconstruct this 1.3 trillion going forward. So this is not this was this was a movement started you know in the United States. I think it was called Occupy Student Debt outside of the you know Occupy uh, Wall Street movement. But it's fizzled, you know, that's another thing. You know, where, where is, in a way, the staying power, if you want, you know, really in a sense. I mean, Elaine Badiou has staying power, right? I mean, he, he was fidel, you know, he has fidelity to the event, what he considers. He did not participate in the Mitterrand government, whereas Leotard, Derrida, all were part of the educational, they would rush to go in to see the socialist government in, in France. But Badiou saw it very differently. This is interesting to me, you know, that people would, you know, be able to see through this stuff. So, the yeah. debt jubilee yeah. is the concept. Yeah, the debt yeah. jubilee. Right. Based exactly. on the Bible. Right. Based exactly. on the yeah. Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. The ju jubilee year. Yeah, the that's jubilee. That's what they had yeah. called yeah. it. We have a student in New York who's actually doing a PhD on this. Uh, who's doing a, he's pretty far along with this point. Yeah. Yeah. The, on the, the debt, the whole dynamic. The thing I participated in with Occupy Wall yeah. Street was a, uh, a debt-a-thon where we paid off people's medical debt. Hmm. And, and they got a, a letter in the mail saying, your debt's been retired, love Occupy. But let's not pay off any debts. As, as Nietzsche <laughs> said, our ability to remember curses us. Yes. Yes. That we remember that we owe things. We would be free to, freer if we could forget. As we know in the German language, debt and guilt are very closely associated. So we have that as well, you know, psychologically. Yeah, and I have a suspicion that debt, I, you know, I've been talking about, I try to interview people in the financial world a uh, bit, and, uh, and that they're, they're thinking about what to do with the debt, like turning debt into money in a sense. I mean, it already is money. Clearly, right? Well, but that in a is different money. way. Yeah, yeah. It is money. It's a but, way but of another way. Right. But it's a generalized, yeah, yeah but it but yeah. now is a actual form of value in this that's right, it, it's yeah. debt as opposed to the asset side, right? I mean, uh, it, it does it does it's money on both sides, clearly. But there's a new thing that they're cooking up. They're not we are they're not worried about that the way we are that we understand how debt is money. They're thinking, wait a second, we can turn this the more you the more you take out, you get back. You know, the more you consume, you get back, and then you use that, what you get back. This is the scheme that's being played with. It will be used to pay off a small amount of the debt, right? There's, you know, those minimum payments. So in other words, the more debt you take on, the more you're able to pay back your previous. This is, the, this is what's going on. They're actually trying to figure out a way out of this, uh, you know, right? The, the system, that they, they understand that the debt's gonna, 
they've got to do something with it, right? I mean, they, they understand why it makes so much sense. So, of course, people will say basic income is one other, but, but this is they way had They way had something that. similar for mortgage, mortgage-backed right. securities, which <coughs> was the downfall of many a bank and investment house at, you know, Lehman Brothers and whatever, and mm -hmm. working with these mortgage-backed securities, yeah, which they starts. tried trading, yeah. and the defaults involved in these bundles of mortgages, you, you know, people could have a mortgage divided into different bundles, which were different securities, mm -hmm. and there was no way of dealing with the, <laughs> Uh, the security of default, where who would default and what security would would be the result? Yeah, this is where the algorithm is always operative, or algorithms, right? Because you know, the new securitization culture, right, mm -hmm. is always needing shifts in the algorithms on, on a daily basis. This is why traders think about yen, U.S. Mm -hmm. you know dollar relations or U.S. dollars of the LIBOR overnight, uh, you know interbank loan rate. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you have this massive, massive, you know, situation of, of abstractions that you know are very hard again to comprehend. You know, we, we, you know, they can keep this going forever, right? In some ways, the system because they have learned how to. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be totally cynical here or pessimistic. I mean, you know, the, obviously we have to fight and struggle. But think about this: every debt. Say you go in and you need more money from the bank for your house. This is the way they make money constantly. So if you go into debt a little bit, you're going to go into debt more and more and more, right? I mean, this is really how they constitute the consumer society. They don't care, you know. These statistics don't alarm them that most households have, you know, two to one ratios above their, you know, their annual income. You know, these they may worry a few people, but really, ultimately, the system does not worry about this. They're things. worried if you yeah. pay off your debt. Yes, of course. They're worried you, that if you pay your debt, they lose that client right. base, right. Right. that income and right. revenue that they right. lose if right. you pay it off. Well, okay. so the, but yeah. the asymptotic limits in terms of that's the problem, right? whether there is uh, such, such a thing exists in terms of debt. In other words, it's what I call kind of a crisis of expenditure, uh, which is that, uh, you know, right, that basically if you cannot, if you cannot meet your debt payments, right, mm -hmm. was, you, you achieve so much and the cost, the broad cost becomes so great, you actually can't, right? You can take on, but that's what I'm saying, that's the question, is there? So that's why I think they're playing with how to relieve that with new mechanisms. But it's not, right. not disagreeing, but they well, recognize there's a yeah. problem. Yeah. That at a certain point, mm -hmm. you, you mean to service the debt, you right. You you must have. Right. You, 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 that, that you know. Only one place can sort of do that to take care, of, which is the United States, because it's able to print. You know, it's a reserve currency. So th this is not a problem for the U.S. Uh, I mean, we could argue that it would be, but uh, they, they have. I think in this current moment, it isn't. But um, but for that people, be, that's a question of sovereign debt. Sovereign so, right, debt. Exactly. Private, 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 private debt. debt. Exactly. Private. So the so the only private debt where this is the uh, the pressure. There's actually this. It's an, a symptic uh, level right, that goes off, 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 and then it hits the point where it can no longer, right? Everybody's familiar with that function, right? You, you hit a top wall yeah. in a sense, a ceiling, mm -hmm. that it just simply cannot. So that becomes, that, that's the that's question. And I think they're aware of that in the sense of, I'm not disagreeing with you. No, no, I understand. They, yeah. They're trying to think of ways of coping. Yes, that's of why course. I brought up this example yeah. of that this construction mm -hmm. of that, yeah. There's always but, debt or prisons, and there's a lot of money in prisons. <laughs> right. You mean the labor in prisons. Yeah. It hasn't been, prison it just comes becoming the profit centers. People are less valuable for their, their what you can get from exploiting them than right. for simply for their debt. Yeah. And it doesn't that constitute a new subjectivity in people? Well, I, I think what we're discussing here, and this is certainly in need of, of, of a major theorizing, is the kind of transition from a homo economicus, you know, to homo datum. You know, how is it now this new, you know, moment of data, data mining, you know, this new subjectivity, the way the system sees, you know, quote unquote, personhood, individual, whatever you want to call it, you know, processes of, uh, you know, of, of, growing up, you know, uh, uh, the 
becoming an adult and all of this. How is this constituted beyond that of just the simple economic, you know, now that the data has entered the equation? And this is where, again, this whole sense of the algorithm, the quantitative, you know, approach, the quants on Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these people used to be laughed at on Wall Street, you know, 50, 60 years ago. You know, they had the people called the charts. Mm -hmm. They never made the big money because all they did was look at bar graphs or whatever. It was the people like the Warren Buffetts who made the money because they understood the fundamentals of a company. These things no longer matter anymore. And weren't they called the elves? The elves, right, right, mm -hmm. something like that. So yeah, I think I think this is a, 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 a again a major shift in the way we're we're trying to think this through post May of '68. This 50 years of both you know boredom and you know on the other side, is it an unf you know unfinished revolution? I mean, certainly it's an unfinished revolution with the tools of the radical imagination. If you look at what's living and and dead in Marxism, you know I think you have to look at both. You know you can't just say I am a Marxist today because in a sense there are certain aspects in the thinking you know you have to expand upon the chapter 25 of volume 3 on fictitious capital and how that's working and what does fictitious capital mean whereas some other things you know in terms of just simple rates of exploitation and how would you constitute this labor theory of value are these things that are outmoded you know theoretically I'm not, you know I'm, I think this is very much open open to discussion and then and this shift we have to, you know, technological capitalism or, 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 or a global, you know, garrison state, you know, a transnational uh, gar garrison kind of state is what we're dealing with, of which, you know, the U.S. is obviously the military force for. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank everyone for... Yeah, thank you for participating. Thank you. And, 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 and if you want to, uh, you know, leave your emails, that would be great. We'll put you on the mailing list. And we have, for the people that came in late, we have classes being offered at the new uh, Convergent uh, Project of the uh, uh, Institute for the Radical Imagination, Democracy at Work, and uh, the uh, Marxist Educational Project. Please, go ahead. Or you can join our mailing list by going to our website, yes. the Institute for the Radical Imagination, and then you can you get email updates. What was that? What was that again? Institute for the Radical Imagination. Oh, you're basically the name of the name. Yeah. Okay, Google it. You Google it. You'll sound you in the website.